Great to see you. Um, we are live and alive at Global Hack Week and ready to start the last segment of the classification algorithms um, track. So congratulations for making it through all three and see, have a chat here. Hello there, Halal 2022, great to see you. And hello there, only Ak Akshaj, really great to see you in the chat. And actually, I think we had a few questions as the stream was getting started today. So I wanted to just address those now. Um, for any questions about swag drops, um, we have a whole team that's working to get your swag to you on time and without a delay. So they are available at the ticket system. And so if you go into Discord and you use our ticket tool, which you can navigate to by typing the commands that I sent in the chat, backslash new will create a new ticket. Um, that's a great, a great way to um, get any issues resolved with swag drops or answer any questions. And there was also um, another uh, comment about missing some sessions today, but uh, I just wanted to point out that all the sessions are recorded on Twitch and YouTube. So if you are interested, um, go ahead and check those out. Hi there, 404. Really great to see you. Um, sorry to hear that your <laughs> sleep schedule's not going great. Definitely, um, uh, definitely pro sleep, everybody, um, even in Global Hack Week. But anyway, let's go ahead and, and start for today. And so let me navigate us to our presentation. We always have a little lecture at the beginning just to get folks interested, get folks oriented to the algorithm of the day. And today's algorithm is the Markov decision process algorithm. So who in the chat has heard of Markov chains, Markov decisions, things like that? Has anybody in the chat heard about these? Um, they are basically stochastic. So what stochastic means is that we have a random um, element to the model. So not everything is determined. In um, other models, like our decision tree model that we'd studied um, in the previous session, the decision tree is determined. In other words, if I give you a outcome, I know which branch you're going to end up in because the thresholds are all single fixed values. But in the Markov decision process algorithm, um, there's random probabilities of transitions between states. And I see some folks in the chat with a little bit of experience with Markov. So why don't we get started with today? And in the previous session, I sent a link about to a computer file, um, which was a really great video on Markov decision, uh, decision process. So I'm going to actually resend that link because I think it's really great video um, and can give you a, a good sense of, of, of exactly what we're talking about today. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna also be giving you a sense of it. And so the learning type that a Markov decision process is, is reinforcement learning, which is kind of a blend or an alternative between unsupervised and supervised learning. And so with reinforcement learning, we give a scenario to the algorithm and without training it, it will design a natural policy that will fit that scenario. And so we are going to give the scenario and you might ask, what, is, what does it mean for that to be the case? Well, we need states. So possible states that the actors can be in transitions, which is possible states that they can transition to and the probabilities that those states could be transitioned into. We need actions that they can take and some outcomes that would result from those actions. So those are all really good things to keep in mind with the Markov decision process. And let's look at a real world example. So we're going to look at a travel scenario, and this is kind of inspired by the commute example given by computer file, but this is for traveling and it's actually going to be traveling in the United States. 
So I have an example of two large cities in the United States, San Francisco, California, and Los Angeles, California. And between them, there is like maybe 800 kilometers of distance. Actually, no, that's too much. Maybe like 700 kilometers. Um, and so in order to get from one city to the other, there are these three options. We can either take the train. And for those of you who don't know, train travel in the U.S. Is, takes pretty long. So the train from San Francisco to Los Angeles, Amtrak, takes 11 hours. Um, the car we could take as well. We could take a car ride down the interstate highway, and that will take about six hours. And, oh, we have a chat. I just want to let you know, um, I mate Scully, you are not late at all. We, we only just started talking about Markov decision processes. And we're, we're exploring a scenario where the, that algorithm can be used. And so this is a travel between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And the third option here is planes. So we could, um, we could travel by airplane from these two cities and arrive in Los Angeles in just 1.5 hours. And so in this simple diagram, what is the best policy to get to Los Angeles as fast as possible? Does, does anyone know what the best policy would be? The only thing we're interested in is reducing our commute time as slow as possible or as quickly as possible. We don't care about price in this example or convenience. And yeah, so we have folks in the chat saying plane. And in fact, plane is definitely the right answer here. I mean, think of how much hours you're going to save um, taking the plane. But yes, as you mentioned, um, hello, it would definitely be more costly a plane ticket will probably be more expensive. Although if you have a gas guzzling car, you, gas could be pretty expensive too in the car. But let's leave that out. We're going to, of course, take the plane ride because 1.5 hours is the least amount of time to get to Los Angeles. But let's look at a more complicated example now. Um, and we're going to now add in possible delays. So. The train is pretty reliable, so we're not going to add a delay there, but we will add a delay for the car and say that there's a 10% chance of severe traffic on our route, as much as an hour of extra traffic. Um, and so that would bring the total time in the car path up from six to seven hours, one in every 10 times. So now we're going to add in another example here. Let's add in some delays for the plane. So the plane, let's say there's a 10% chance of a security delay and security takes a really long time and it takes two hours to get through security. Okay. And then let's say there's a 25% chance of a plane delay, uh, which could take three hours, up to three hours. Maybe the crew got in late or there's a baggage issue or some kind of um, other problem with the mechanical problem with the plane. And that could take up to three hours. And so then finally we have a 5% chance of a deplane delay. And so getting off the plane, um, we could have an error. And so what would be the most optimal scenario in this case? Um, with all of these delays, well, um, what would you choose if you needed to get to LA in eight hours or less, but you also want to get there as fast as possible? Actually, let's save this for later. In this example that we have here, um, with the plane, the security delay, the plane delay, and the deplane delay, it's still better to take the plane because we can multiply the odds. So we have 1.5 hours, that's 1.5, plus a 10% chance of a security delay, which will usually take on average 12 minutes. And then we have a 25% chance of a plane delay. 
So that will take 180 minutes times 0 0.25, which is um, 45 minutes, and a 5% chance of a deep lane delay, which will on average take three minutes. So everyone in the chat is saying plane still, and that's absolutely true. And the plane will take 150 minutes, I think. The math might be a little wrong on that. I think it's, I think it's right though. Um, no. Right. So, so, so in other words, 2.5 hours um, to get to your destination on average. Right. So all of you who are saying the plane is still good, you're correct. But what would you choose if you needed to get to LA in eight hours or less? So let's say that you have a, um, an appointment, a really important business meeting in Los Angeles and you leave San Francisco when, right when you wake up in the morning at eight o'clock, the business meeting is at 4 p.m. You need to get to LA in eight hours or less. But we also wanna get there as fast as possible. What would be the best way to go? Does anybody have a guess about this one? We're actually optimizing for a slightly more complex thing and we're actually constrained, we're optimizing within a constraint so we're saying within a constraint, which is we must get to LA in eight hours, what is the optimal path to take? And um, yeah, this is a really interesting question. Does anybody have an idea of how we could optimize for this? So Halal would choose plane, but look, but but Halal, look at look at this. If if you choose plane and and the worst case scenario happens, you get a security delay. That's two point five hours. You get a plane delay. That's three hours. This five and a half hours already. You get a plane. Um, it, it takes it takes six seven hours, and um, D plane delay takes one hour. Uh, yeah, that puts you at exactly eight hours. Um, Ah, well, uh, yeah, actually, you're right. <laughs> I guess I designed this one here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edit this here. It takes a 1.1 1. 1 hour, okay? So you you are correct. That is the correct answer. But what? let's just assume 1.1 1. 1 hour. So it takes a little bit too long. And someone says, I have a question. In real life, how can you know the exact delay time you will be going to be having prior to leaving? Um, well, that's a good question. We don't. So, so that's why we assign probabilities. So we cannot know how long we will be delayed. Um, so that's why we're assigning these probabilities. So in real life, we can't know, oh, there's an hour delay at the airport. No, we can only know the probabilities. But it um, seems like now folks are saying cars. Uh, wouldn't car be, be, be safer? And this is such an interesting answer, Sandra. I can use internet in the car for communicating with the team. I like that idea. Um, that's very smart. And safer, safer bet, maybe. So the problem with going in the car the whole time is that it takes seven hours. Um, and so it will get us under that eight hour length, but actually it will be very long. So Here's the optimal strategy. Go home, go to the airport, visit the airport and wait in the security line. If it takes more than one hour in the security line, then leave and go to your car. So this is very expensive, right? It could take, you have to buy a plane ticket and you might not even take the plane if, if, if the security is taking too long. But if you get through that security delay, then you will have a much faster ride to Los Angeles. And on the other hand, if after one hour you are in security line, you still haven't gotten to the plane, then you can take the car and still be guaranteed to, to get to Los Angeles. Okay, so that is the optimal strategy. It is kind of complex, um, but we can still, as humans, figure it out. On the other hand, 
once you get to more complicated situations, we need to use machine learning to find the optimal strategy. All right, everybody. So this is um, where it kind of gets tricky and interesting um, with the Markov decision process. And designing an optimal policy is not something that we can always do um, intuitively. All right. So we can assign states to each of these different things in our scenario. So we can say being in San Francisco is state zero. And then we can transition into different states, state one, three, six. And then we have probabilities of transitioning to other ones once we get there. So um, that would kind of be the what we call the state transition matrix or T. And so let's look at this. If we have if we're in state one, what's the probability that we transition into state two? Well, if you look at our diagram, state one is that we choose the car as our transportation mode. And the state two is traffic. So P12 is 0 0.1. Um, so now after that, we have a other example from state one to state seven. So what would be P17? In this case, P12 is 0 0.1, P17 is 0 0.7. I'm glad, I'm glad folks like the example. It seems like a couple comments. And actually, the example is um, partly mine, but also partly from the computer file video. So that is, uh, that is a really good resource to look at. Um, so go ahead and check that out um, if you're interested. So yeah, P17, the probability would be 0 0.9 because 0 0.1 is the probability of severe traffic. So the probability that we don't run into severe traffic and go straight to P17 is, um, to state seven is 0 0.9. And we also have a rewards matrix. So this is the rewards matrix. And for example, if we start in zero and we choose state six, the reward we get for that is 11 hours. So that would be the um, that would be the time taken on the journey. And in this example, we actually want to minimize our reward. So we could maximize our reward. We could minimize our reward. It's totally the same from the perspective of a computer um, algorithm, um, like an optimization algorithm. So. Um, this is our rewards matrix. And once we have our probability transition matrix and our rewards matrix, we can design a policy. Um, in other words, the ideal choice to make in every state. So let's do that in an example. And we'll be going into Python to do this example. So before we do that, I wanted to send a link in the chat, which will be our workshop for today. And go ahead and open this up in your favorite Python interpreter, your favorite Jupyter Notebook interpreter environment, rather. Um, if I just pasted that link in the chat. This is a link to lesson three, the code for lesson three of the ML classification workshop. And why don't I go ahead and share my screen and open this up for you all. So let's see. Right. And so you can now see the, um, the Markov decision process algorithm. And we're going to be using a Python library called MDP Toolbox. And you must install um, MDP Toolbox in order to um, follow along today. And that can be done using the pip package. So go ahead and install through pip. Um, you can either use your Python environment, your, your Jupyter Notebook environment, using the command in the first cell here, or you can use your terminal and just simply type pip install pymd tool, p toolbox. And that's gonna install a 
package that is specifically designed to implement Markov decision process. Okay. So I'm going to assume that you are able to do that. Um, and once you're able to install MDP toolbox, don't worry, you'll have a little bit of time because we're going to go through this example, which is a forest management example. Um, we have to import some relevant libraries. So go ahead and import those. And then um, we have our forest management example. So this is the, this is the scenario. Trees can either be young, middle-aged, or old. So those are states zero, one, and two. And every year, the trees will pass from one stage to the next. So each year, the trees get one stage older. And so they'll go from stage young to stage middle-aged. Or if they're in stage middle-aged, they'll go to old. And of course, if they get to old, the next year, they just stay old. They can't get younger. Each year, there is a 10% chance that the whole forest burns down so that this tree will actually disappear. And if the forest burns down, you will get nothing, no reward. Uh, that would be a really bad scenario. Luckily, only a 10% chance, right? But if you cut down the trees, here's what will happen. You get zero points for a young one. So how can you sell... Um, the wood from a, from a really small tree, for example, like a twig, it won't be useful for anything. You'll get one point for a middle-aged tree where you can get some wood out of that and two points for an old big tree um, that you could maybe build a really nice table out of or a nice chair. And if the forest reaches its oldest state and you do not cut, you will receive four points. So um, if the forest reaches its oldest state, that is really good. You've improved the ecosystem and made a lot of natural benefits. So maybe the government will give you some money um, to maintain that forest for the wildlife. Maybe you could, um, yeah, benefit in that way. So we want to know, what is the best strategy for managing this forest given these facts? And it's not easy to know um, based on just human chance, uh, I mean, human intuition, um, what the optimal strategy would be. In other words, what the policy we should design. But we are going to use the Markov decision process to do that. So let's first speak about the inputs. So we have our inputs here. Oops, sorry, everybody. Just went really far down. So the inputs are S, which is the number of states. So we have three different states. So the default is actually three, but we'll keep that. R1 is the reward that you get when you wait and the forest is in its oldest state. So um, for example, in our example, R1 would be equal to four. R2, on the other hand, is the reward that you get when you cut the trees and the forest is in its oldest state. Um, in this case, two. Um, and so one would be what you would get in the middle age state. And P is the probability of a wildfire occurrence. And so we're going to place these inputs into our forest function, which is just a already designed example from NDP toolbox, but you could actually create your own transition probability matrix um, if you have a particular example that you wanna analyze. Um, and out of the, this forest method, we will get P and R. And so P is the transition probability matrix, a NumPy array of shape ASS, where A is the possible actions and S is the possible states. And R is the reward matrix of shape S comma A, where if we have something in some state and we take some action, then the value in the matrix will be the reward associated with that state and action. So let's explore the probability transmission transition matrix. So P, this is P here. So actually let's run, let's run this because I think it might not be um, run yet. Hmm. Taking a while actually. Okay. 
So let's just write type out P. So P has shape A, S, S. So the first dimension is the actions. So let's explore the P0, which is the probability transition matrix if the action weight is chosen. So if weight is chosen, what's the probability that the youngest, a youngest tree um, stays in the young state in the next generation? Well, that probability is 0 0.1 because that's the likelihood of a fire, wildfire. But what's the probability that it will advance to the next oldest state? Well, we can say if we wait, which is zero, then the forest in the youngest state, which is zero, would transfer to the next oldest, which is one, and we get 0 0.9. So you can see how this matrix works. We have the possible states and their transition probabilities, and that's how P is constructed. And then we have our rewards matrix. So our rewards matrix, it looks like this. And so the first column, 0, 0, 4, is the reward profile of a, of a tree if we choose the action weight. And so you can see weight doesn't pay off until the very end. 0 um, if you're a super young tree, even 0 if you're a middle-aged tree, but once you get to late age tree or old tree, you get four points, which is more than the entire cut uh, cut row combined. So um, that's the profile of cut. So what reward do we get if we choose to wait and the forest is in its oldest state? Well, we just multiply our rewards matrix, the first column of our rewards matrix, by the vector 0, 0, 1 which is the oldest state vector. And then we add up the, the, the rewards and we get four points. But if, if the farce is in any other state, so I've just placed young and middle-aged here just to illustrate that, even though obviously a tree cannot be both young and middle-aged, we get zero. If we choose to cut and the farce is in its oldest state, we get two points. If the forest is in its second youngest state, we get one. So you can see how the rewards matrix will work. Does anybody have any questions about the probability transition matrix or the rewards matrix? Feel free to ask those at any time. All right, looks like folks are clear on this. So we're actually going to take a break now and give you some time to absorb all this information. When we come back, we're going to discuss the actual optimization algorithm, which is a reinforcement algorithm called Q-learning. Um, and someone says, how has the probability been calculated? So that's a great question. And you would just have to calculate this yourself. The computer cannot calculate the probabilities. This is human given. So it's almost like supervised learning where we give the algorithm examples of successful classifications. In this example, we would have to give the algorithm a scenario. And so, for example, we could look at the historical rates of wildfire and see how many years are there wildfires? How many years are there no wildfire? And get a probability from that. Um, but yeah, we totally need to give the give the computer probabilities um, that we would measure as humans or assess, assign. Yeah, and um, could be useful in robotics. For example, you might have an assembly line, and um, sometimes uh, there's an error that goes wrong in the assembly line, or a part is slightly um, off, and yeah. Okay, so someone says, kindly give an overview of what we are trying to achieve. So we're trying to see whether or not we should cut the forest down or wait. Um, and how many points can we get? Um, so if you're a forest management person, um, you want to balance the needs of wildlife and balance the profits from cutting the trees. So that is the example here. So you could look at your tree and say, this is a middle-aged tree. And 
Um, given that, should I cut it down or should I wait for it to become an old tree? So that's what we will design after the break is our policy. And the policy will tell us which action to take, cut or wait at every single state. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, we will be back shortly. Um, but for now, we will just have a shorter break, just 10 minute break, and uh, we'll come back later.
Hi there, everybody. Great to see you back after our break. Um, yeah, awesome. And let's get started with the last part of the workshop, which will be finding out the optimal policy for our decision making algorithm. And um, we have a request in the chat. Kindly repeat the steps of finding the rewards after the break. So let's actually go into that and um, we, will, we will share a screen and show that one. No problem. That's a, that's a great question. So let's go back to our rewards matrix. So rewards matrix, rewards matrix has shape S, A. Meaning that the rewards matrix covers every possible state, sorry, every possible state and the associated action. For example, if we are in state zero, which is the youngest tree, then no matter what action we choose, zero points are awarded. On the other hand, if we are in the middle age state, so the tree is middle aged, then waiting provides zero points, but cutting the tree provides one point. So actually in the middle age stage, it is more beneficial um, to cut the tree down if you're only thinking about the short term case. But then in the late stage, it is beneficial to wait because waiting will create a four point reward, whereas cutting the tree will create a two point reward. But remember, there's also a 10% chance uh, that you will get zero by waiting. Um, but clearly that's not enough to outweigh two points, uh, or I guess we will see. So that is the rewards matrix. And this is how you could find a particular value. Um, so in this case, we have our rewards matrix and we use dot T to transpose the matrix. So dot T, if we just apply dot T, it, it just reverses the columns and the rows. So now the first row is actually the first column of the rewards matrix. And someone says the first column is of weight, the second is of cut, and that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so when we transpose, we're actually making the first row weight and the second row cut um, so that we can access them easily with just a simple index value. So that's the reason why we do r.t. And then r.t0 is the rewards vector for weighting, as was mentioned in the chat. And r1 is the rewards metric matrix for cutting. So if we cut the tree, and our tree is in any of these three states, this rewards vector will tell us which reward um, is applied for completing that action in a given state. Okay, so that's the reward matrix in a nutshell. And that's why we're just using this um, sum and multiplication to just kind of multiply the state by the reward and get the total reward, okay? So let's move on to finding the optimal policy. And we're going to use the Q learning algorithm, which is a reinforcement algorithm um, to get the optimal result. And there's actually a lot of different results. Um, there's all, I'm sorry, a lot of different algorithms that you can choose from. And I'm not gonna go into those today, but we will go into how to use Q learning. Uh, which is one of the more popular optimization algorithms. So to call this function, we use mdptoolbox.mdp.qlearning. And qlearning method will take three parameters uh, at minimum. The first is p, which is our probability uh, state transition matrix of probabilities, and r, which is our rewards matrix. So those are the two matrices that describe our situation, our scenario. And then it takes this parameter, which is called discount. And discount is kind of an interesting variable that I'm just going to leave it at 0 0.1 for now. But 
we'll see what happens when we mess with discount. And then we type model.run to run the optimization. And model.policy will then give us our optimal policy. So you can see that doing so gave us a policy of 0, 1, 1. And what does that mean? Um, well, I'll tell you. So what this policy indicates is the ideal choice, which 0 representing weight and 1 representing cut of, um, of our states. So in the youngest state, the tree is actually the optimal policy it found was to wait until the next year. In the middle state, the model found that the optimal policy was to cut. So you can see if you ask, should we wait or cut in the youngest, in the second youngest state or the middle age state, the answer is to cut down the tree. And then model policy two, actually, this should this should say one. Um, sorry about that. Let's see. No, oh, I guess the, the the saved error was not correct. But in in the in the last in the last case, yeah, this makes more sense anyway. Um, in the last case, the oldest tree should we wait or cut? And so you would say wait, and our policy would agree that wait is the ideal scenario for that one. Okay, so now we're going to learn about the discount feature, and discount is a very important um, aspect of our model. Discount tells you what the um, future will look like. So if we think that our game will continue for a long time into the future, um, then we can apply a very high discount value. So for example, in this first cell, we apply a 99% discount. 99% discount says it is very likely that the game will continue into the future. So this is a way we can develop a long-term strategy if we're assuming things are very stable. So a great analogy could be in the financial markets. Um, if you have a single company, a single company, you are not so sure that the company will continue to have profits a hundred years from now. But if you look at the overall economy, it is much more likely that the overall economy will continue to grow far into the future, um, even like a hundred years into the future, as has been shown with stock market data and global GDP data. Um, you can see that stock market would be a 99% discount case, whereas a individual company might be much lower. So now let's look at the opposite case, which is a 1% discount. This would be, um, oh, and I should say that in the long-term strategy case, the policy that our Q learning algorithm says is best is actually just to wait every single time. Um, wait in the young state, wait in the middle state and wait in the old state. Um, so this is a very long-term looking strategy. But in the 1% discount case, this is means that it's very likely the game will not continue in the future or the scenario will not continue. I should maybe say the scenario so we keep our um, terminology consistent. So for example, um, here's an example. Let's say that it is um, a very popular um, sale. Um, so it's a holiday and there's a big sale at the, at the store. It is very likely that the next day um, there, those sales will be gone because the holiday will end and all the prices will return to normal. So if we want to design an algorithm to get the best deals, spend the least amount of money, get the most values, um, we should design it with short-term um, scenario um, with, a, with a very low discount, 0 0.01, for example. So in that case, let's see what the policy is. So in the young case, our tree, we should wait. And in the middle case, we should... Uh, cut the tree. 
down. And in the old case, we should wait. So this is our policy for the very short term, um, low discount scenario. All right. So um, you can see how we could possibly arrive at different policies based on long term or short short term strategic thinking. All right. So what do folks think about this? Does anybody have any questions about this before we um, we finish up for the day? And I encourage you to try building your own um, scenarios. Uh, with the probability transition matrix and reward matrix of your choice. Um, yeah, it can be really interesting to explore these possibilities. Yeah. Okay, can we choose a different middle discount middle value? Sure, let's try 0.5. Um, so 0 0.5 says that we should wait, um, but what about 0 0.3? Interesting. So really waiting is almost always good unless you have a very low confidence in the future. And someone says, how has the discount value gotten? That is a really good question. And um, I think the discount value is something that we as humans have to give the model um, because it's kind of impossible to measure the discount value. But if you um, maybe have some historical data, you could, you could potentially um, get a better value for the discount value. So like for, for, for those scenarios that... Um, we described, you know, it might be better to actually val vary the discount value a lot like we're doing right now, like um, like Halal suggested, to just see how the strategy changes as you increase the discount value. Um, and you can see as we get to higher and higher discount values, um, the model goes from a cut model to a weight model. So it could be interesting. And someone says, does the discount value seem nonlinear or linear to you? And the discount value will be nonlinear in cases where you have a possibility to return to previous states, um, um, to have um, loops in your, in your transition matrix. So it's not at all guaranteed that um, the behavior of this system is linear. And if the behavior was linear, in fact, it would be it would not require such an advanced machine learning algorithm. Um, the, it would be easier to compute the um, optimal scenario. But yeah, if you design a complex scenario, um, you can absolutely get a nonlinear discount value. So that's a really, really good, good, good question there. Yeah, I, I highly encourage you to play with this. And there's there's also another package in MDP Toolbox, um, which is called example.rand. So let's look at that real quick. Example.rand. Oh, we need S and A. And so S will be um, the number of states. So let's choose maybe five states. And A is the number of possible actions. So if we have five different states and four possible actions, you know, our probability transition matrix can get really, really large. So this is the probability transition matrix that was randomly generated. And here is the rewards matrix that was also randomly generated. So you can, you can play around with some random examples. And in fact, I highly encourage you to check those out. See if you can build your own, um, and if you don't have if you don't have the time to meticulously construct a transition matrix, you can just play with a random example um, using MDP Toolbox, which is really neat. 
All right, everyone. Well, we are now finished with our workshop. So I, I wanted to um, send you uh, one last time the check-in link. Let us know um, what you think of the workshops. And one of the best ways you can let us know is by checking in because that way we can measure our participation, see who's interested in what material or not who. We actually just look to see are people interested in, in the material. Um, and, and that helps us guide our future workshops. So, yeah. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for your time today and hope you have a great rest of Global Hack Week. See you next time.